Welcome to Numerical Methods. And today I would like to start talking about the Monte Carlo method. And yeah, this is maybe really one of my favorite topics here because I will start very easily, very simple. And I will also repeat some aspects from school, like for example, what is a drawing of a random variable? Yeah, How is that actually modeled? And the interesting thing is that if you look again at how you do a drawing of a random variable, you get some insight. You do understand suddenly why the Monte Carlo method has a certain advantage. And this certain advantage is that it can break the curse of dimensionality. I will explain what this is. But the curse of dimensionality is, for example, um, classical numerical integration yeah, scales exponentially with the dimension. To, to achieve the same accuracy in higher dimensions, you have to take exponentially more sample points. And the Monte Carlo method is breaking this curse of dimension because the achieved accuracy is independent of the dimension of the function that you integrate. If you do uh, integration with the Monte Carlo method, which is then called Monte Carlo integration. And already today, there is the aspect, yeah, um, why this is the case. So we will see why this is the case. And we will also see a drawback. The drawback is that the results which we will derive uh, only hold in probability. This seems to be a killer you know, bug because if it only holds in probability, actually we know nothing about our numerical results. But the interesting aspect is that we can fix this. Yeah? So later we will do things, quasi Monte Carlo methods that actually do not have this defect that they hold in probability that we get pointwise results. So it will be quite a journey, but on our way is, for example, here, this result, the Monte Carlo integral error estimate. And the surprising thing here is that we have a function in RD. Yeah? So D arguments, D dimensions. Yeah? We integrate here over the D dimensional hypercube. Yeah? And you see there is no D in our in our estimate. Yeah? The error estimate is actually independent of the dimension. The D does not appear in the probabilistic error estimate. So this is the drawback of the method. We have a P here. It is a probabilistic error estimate. OK, this is uh, where I would like to go yeah? using a few session with you but I will start uh, very easily. So remarks were Monte Carlo is very versatile, very simple, very easy to implement. This is also a big advantage. You can do parallelization on GPUs and so very easily. It copes well with problems in high dimension. So it breaks the curse of dimensionality, but some of our results only hold in probability but this can be fixed. So let's start with an introduction. So in mathematical finance, you know, which is our application, which lies in the background, well, the problem of risk neutral valuation, we had this in the motivation, this requires that we calculate an expectation of a random variable. So this first part is about calculating expectations of a random variable numerically. And as an introduction, let us consider now the case of, say, a discrete random variable. So there is a discrete random variable here, Z. Yeah? So I only have a probability space omega yeah, with elements omega 1 to omega n. Yeah? So n and guys here, and um, I would like to calculate the expectation of this 
discrete random variable z. So I can do this by just taking the value of the random variable and I multiply with the probability that this value occurs and I take the sum over all the uh, events that can happen. So now I would like to do something a bit stupid. I would like to maybe approximate this probability here in a you know, very inefficient way, yeah, numerically. So if I would like to approximate the probability P, so I could do this by just generating a sequence. So this is now the sequence XK here. A sequence of my events, you know? and then I would like to have the property that the ev events are drawn, you know, drawn according to the probability. So xk equals omega i occurs in the sequence. Yeah, you know, so this is true in the sequence with probability p of omega i. So in other words. If I take the average of the indicator function, so here I have the indicator function, xk is equal to omega i, for a fixed omega i. If I take the sequence of this indicator function and I sum up all the outcomes, yeah? so this means I just count how often do I observe omega i. And if I then take the average, then this converges to the probability of omega i. Well, this is actually what I would expect from a random experiment. Yeah, if you, for example, or throw a fair dice, yeah, you would expect that you observe the number three, yeah, exactly with probability one over six, but exactly maybe in the limit, yeah, this uh, sum should converge to one over six. So maybe I try this little example here. Let's take n is equal to 6. My omega is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, every guy has the same probability. Yeah, So I have an equidistribution. And I would like to generate now such a sequence here. And then use this expression as an approximation for the probability. We can do this in the computer. Yeah? Maybe I play a little bit and show you what uh, what we have as tools. So I create a new class. Maybe this is just um, a random integer sequence, yeah? which I would like to create. So let's call now the package Monte Carlo because this is our chapter on Monte Carlo. Yeah, and there is an, a helpful class called random. So which is uh, in Java util dot in Java util. Um, actually, this guy needs an argument or can have an argument which is uh, the seed. Okay, so if I import it, I don't need the specification of the package. And I have a random number generator. And now for this random number generator, I can generate a few random numbers. Yeah, so uh, maybe I generate 100 random numbers. So I have a small loop here. So if you look, this random number generator has a method called next int. So it will generate an integer random number. You can also pass a bound. Yeah, then he will generate a number between zero inclusive and the specified bound exclusive. So if I take now next int with a bound of say six, yeah, he will generate the numbers between zero and five. So just print this. And we have such a sequence. 
so 3, 4, 3, 0, 2, yeah, whatever. Um, let's add 1. Then it's a number between 1 and 6. Yeah? So it's a number like the one, uh, a sequence like the one on my slide, which I would like to have. And now I would like to check, uh, does actually the number, for example, 3, occur according to the probability? This is a property of this random number generator. Later, we will study different random number generators. Actually, the guys that we will use then generate floating point numbers. So you see there is also a next double here, yeah, which generates a double a floating point number. But now for this experiment, let's stick with the integers. So what I would like to do is I generate now um, a sequence using here this line. So random next integer no, of six plus one. Um, and I would like to calculate now the average of the indicator function, say for some fixed omega i here. This code is already in our repository. And I prepared also a little bit that he will plot the result. So let's have a look into this class. It's not very long. So let's have a look into our lecture. There is now a package on Monte Carlo and there is the running average of the indicator. So there's a little bit of code here that performs some plotting. Let's ignore this. So the function that we will look at is get running average of indicator. This is the omega, which I specify three. This is the number of points, which I would like to sample. And this is actually the uh, seed for the random number generator. I will talk about random number generators in later sessions. So this is the function uh, I would like to discuss. Yeah, what's going on here? Maybe we just uh, debug the code and then I can explain what's going on. So let's set a breakpoint here and run it, but now run it with the debugger. So you see our uh, variable here, uh, sum. I first initialized this sum to zero. Yeah? And then we loop over the number of samples I would like to generate. So I ask my random number generator, okay, please generate a drawing. My first one is a five. Yeah? And then I have my indicator function. If this drawing is equal to my omega, which is a three, then my indicator is one. Otherwise the indicator is zero. Okay, and then I'm just summing up the indicators. Okay, this is my first element. Uh, I started here in zero. So if I would like to calculate the average, I have to divide by i plus one. Yeah, because the programmer often starts its loops from zero. Yeah? Uh, the zeros loop is the first element we have generated. So I divide by i plus one and I get my average. Yeah. So my uh, sum is zero, dividing the zero by one has a zero. I just um, put this average to a list. Yeah? So I'm just collecting all these guys and I'm continuing. So I, I print this out now. You see in the next loop, the number that we draw is a three. My integer, uh, my indicator function has a one, yeah, we hit it the three. My sum is one. The average of the uh, observations is um, an 0 0.5, yeah? So we have two drawings, one observed the three, the other not. Okay, and this code runs on. So we don't observe it, we don't observe it. We don't observe it. So you see this is one half, one over three, one over four, one over two, and uh, the next time we observe it, so this drawing is four, this drawing is four, this is a two, five, 
is three. So the next time we observe it, the integrator jumps up and this value jumps up. Yeah? So instead of a one over 10, I jump to a two over 10. Yeah, if you let the program run, he will generate now this whole sequence. And I generate it up to 100 and he will perform a plot. So actually I do this plot for two different runs, yeah, with two different seeds. So the random number generator generated two different sequences. The sequence which we have uh, just observed was the red one. So the second one was a three and then we have this one divided by n decay and it jumps again up if we observe the three. So this is what we do. And um, indeed, yeah, it looks as if this converges to the one over six, yeah, which is the uh, yeah, assumed uh, probability, so in, in the limit. So we can let this run a little bit longer, yeah, and you see these are now two different sequences, two independent sequences. Yeah? The sequence becomes smoother because the jumps that are added are smaller and smaller. Yeah? It's a one divided by n that is added in every jump. Okay, but sometimes it deviates a little bit. Yeah, But if you would generate multiple such sequences, you would see that they all become closer. So the thing that the red one and the green one yeah, are still a little bit off, this is the probabilistic nature that I was talking about because it depends a little bit on which sequence you used to approximate this uh, probability. Yeah? So with 1,400 sample points, some sequences are already closer, yeah? others are further away. Okay, so now you you think, okay, this is a very inefficient way of calculating the probability, uh, in, in, in particular, if we already know the probability. But uh, let's stick to this, yeah, and uh, do a few uh, calculations. So I now utilize this approximation of the probability P of omega i, I utilize this in this expression that occurred in the calculation of the expectation. So there was Z of omega i times P of omega i. So recall the expectation is the sum over all possible events, yeah, over all events, Z of omega i multiplied with P of omega i. So now, if you read the following line from right to left, yeah, we have the following. We have Z of omega i multiplied with the probability of omega i. This can be approximated, okay, this is a little bit now my assumption, by my sequence xk and averaging the indicator function is xk equal to omega i. So I'm approximating now my probability with this very inefficient way. And if this is converging to the probability, then of course the product z of omega i times this average converges to z of omega i times p of omega i. So now you can, if you go backward on this line, yeah, you can move this here inside the sum. Okay, so this now means I have a sum z of omega i multiplied now with the indicator function and all this is averaged. But if you know that you have the indicator function here, then you actually know that the omega i that is inside this z is 
xk. Yeah? So the next trick is that I can replace this omega i by an xk here. Okay, so I have actually z of xk multiplied with this indicator function and then averaged over all the omega i's. So this is what we have for a specific omega i. And in my expectation, I'm actually summing over all omega i's, yeah? So let's do the sum over all omega i's. So I apply now on the left and the right the sum over all i. So this is what I'm doing here, yeah? Sum this over all i. Yeah, if you sum on the right-hand side, over all i, you get our expectation, yeah, expectation of z. And if I sum over all i on the left-hand side, you see the i only occurs here in this indicator function, yeah. You can interchange the sum, you move the sum over i inside, okay, and what you get is that you just multiply here with a with a one yeah because summing the indicator functions over all omega i yeah if we if we draw any omega i there will be exactly one indicator one and all the others are zero so we will get a one for sure so where did we now arrive so we arrived now in an approximation for the expectation where we do the following. I take my random variable z and I evaluate the random variable on the sequence xk where xk is generated according to the probability. So you see on the left hand side there is no probability occurring because the probability is encoded in how the sequence is generated. Yeah, then you average all these values and this should converge to the um, expectation of z. So the left-hand side is now an approximation, numerical approximation of the expectation of z. So yeah, how is this xk encoding the probability? Yeah, the xk is encoding the probability because say, values that are more likely now occur in the sum more often. So consider again, you have the dice, yeah? But the dice is not fair. Say the one occurs more often. Then in this uh, approximation here, what would happen is that you more often sum up the value z of one. But this looks really inefficient yeah uh, this looks much more efficient because instead of saying i have to sum 20 times the one the set of one and maybe five times the set of uh, uh, two and and so on you could just sum the corresponding values with their weight yeah so this this looks really far more efficient yeah so at first this looks really stupid this looks inefficient but the expression on the left-hand side has now two advantages. So I started with a very elementary example where n is small, yeah, six or something like this. But maybe consider um, a case where n is huge, or for example, where we go to a continuous um, random variable, yeah, so where there are infinitely many omegas. So the number of calculations required to achieve a specific level of approximation, the M, this may be much smaller than the N. 
For example, if my sequence xk is not a sequence of integers, it's a sequence of floating point numbers, and say all floating point numbers have the same probability, there are approximately two to the power of 63 floating point numbers. Yeah? Or oh, this is a 10 to 20, whatever. Yeah? This is a huge amount. So now the expression on the left-hand side is just calculating z of xk, where xk is more likely. Yeah? So somehow he is collecting the values that have inherently a more important value that, that have a higher probability. So this is the first advantage. Second advantage is that we did some kind of decoupling. You know? So the generation of the drawings xk, so the xk was what is modeled with p, this can be done independently from how we generate the set. So from the valuation of the set. And you see that the remaining formula is really very simple. Yeah? So just sum up all the values that Z takes on this sequence. So the lecture will later then discuss how we generate sequences that have a certain probability, yeah? uniform sequences, normal distributed sequences, exponentially distributed sequences, and so on. So these sequences are then encoding the probability. And now in my Monte Carlo method, all I have to do is just evaluate the function on the sequence and take the average. So this is really nice. My example relied that I can interchange the summation. Yeah? Um, you can also reformulate this for a continuous random variable, and we will later consider real-valued random variable, and the sequences will then, of course, become sequences of floating point numbers. Yeah, that was now my motivation of the Monte Carlo approximation. So this here is my Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation.